Hello from me, David Foster. With two-thirds of our planet covered by sea, maybe it's time to look to the horizon for our future energy needs. Are floating wind farms the answer? This is Roundtable. There's a lot of wind out there, so let's use it. But the costs are massive. And yet, if we don't spend, what price will we have to pay? Renewable energy is on course to become the cheapest kind of power to produce in many countries, including the UK. Offshore wind energy is a clean and renewable energy obtained by taking advantage of the force of the wind produced on the high seas. Between 2016 and 2021, nearly $25 billion is being invested in offshore wind in the UK. And for the most part, these mega structures are built into the seabed at depths of up to 60 meters. But now engineers are exploring a new idea, floating wind farms. They could be sighted further away from the coast where the seabed is deeper and the wind speeds faster. One company is building an array of floating wind turbines off the coast of Scotland. There's a catch though. Building further away from coastlines around the world would mean greater expense and make it more costly and more difficult to maintain. So could floating wind farms be a big part of the push to get to net zero emissions? We can say hello to Simon Hogg, Head of Engineering at Durham University, also to James Gilbert, Professor of Engineering at Hull University, working primarily on sensing and measurement in offshore renewables, principally wind. And also Richard Blanchard joins us, Reader in Renewable Energy at Loughborough University, seeing how the world could benefit from the UK's energy transition to net zero, or at least hoped for transition. Great to have all three of you with us. Simon, let me start with you. And by the way, feel free anytime, each one of you, to jump in. I've got a, an offshore wind farm database here. More than 50 countries, China 300 plus, Germany 180, US 150, UK 150. Again, these are anchored wind farms. How much more difficult, since we're talking about floating wind farms, is it to have something that's free and not chain to the seabed. How much more difficult is it, Simon? Yeah, well, when you say anchored wind farms, the, the sort of wind farm you're talking about there, that they're actually on towers that are piled into the seabed. So they're not anchored. They're actually mounted in the seabed directly from it. Um, floating wind, floating wind is anchored to the bed. So these aren't free, free moving structures. They are structures that that have a wind turbine on some sort of platform that is buoyant and therefore floats. And then the platform itself is chained to the seabed, usually by two or three or three or more anchor points. So, so that's the sort of technology we're talking about. Is it more difficult than the fixed? Yes, it is. And the primary difference is because the turbine itself is moving much more. Uh, so, so as the floating body responds to, to waves and the sea state, then the whole turbine structure will move in a way that a fixed structure doesn't. And there are, there are ways of dealing with that. So, so in some type of floating structures that have been uh, developed and, and um, trialled at the moment, many of them on demonstrator projects, that then you may have a, a platform with, say, three floats on it. The, the wind turbine is then mounted on that platform and you can pump water in and out of the three floats to try and damp out the action of the waves on the structure. Uh, others, other types of device use the turbine itself, where the turbine looks at what's happening in terms of the movement that it's seeing from the sea, and it tries to control the loading on the blades of the turbine to damp that out a little bit that way. So those, those sort of technologies that you need for that are obviously additive to what you need for mm. fixed type uh, turbines, and therefore more difficult to develop and cost more. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into how difficult it is to service them in just a moment, but let's take a look at the scale of them. James, let me bring you in on this. Windfloat Atlantic, EU-funded project off the coast of Cornwall. These are massive pieces of kit, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And, you know, the, 
with a wind turbine, the bigger you make them, the more efficient they are and the more cost effective they are. So there's a lot of pressure to make them bigger, but they are huge. You know, wind turbine blades are now some of the biggest manufactured objects that, that you know, humankind has ever made. So they are, they are big. You know, a typical blade now is maybe 80 meters long and we're moving towards 100, 115 meters long. And, you know, so very big structures. Which is, I gather, about the same as you would get of the wingspan of an A380. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it, it's bigger than that already, and, and they are getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, the, the way that the industry's developed, uh, you know, bigger really is better, and, and there have been huge strides forward. And that's partly how cost has been reduced by making these things bigger. Now, there's somebody called Susan Gurevan from the University of Southampton. She's expert in uh, mechanical engineering. She says it is technically feasible, but it's not economically viable. Let's bring in Richard at this point, and then you can all jump in any time you want. Um, it's a, yes, I mean, the, the, the quote um, is an interesting one because uh, I think what we're finding is that from the early stages of all sort of technology developments, things always appear to be more expensive. So when we had the first round of the offshore wind um, industry uh, back in, I think it was 2011, maybe a little bit earlier, uh, the price for uh, a megawatt of electricity was £137, which is very expensive. In the latest round, we're looking at around about £40 per megawatt hour. So the prices have really come down as the industry has expanded. So um, it's a fair comment, but you know, wind energy, offshore wind energy is becoming some of the cheapest uh, form of uh, electricity generation which we have. So it's, it's, it's really uh, great news. And uh, very promising uh, activities which are happening around Britain. We've got the best wind resource in Europe, and so we should make use of it. See, one of the things I was reading, and you are the experts, so tell me about this, is it's in the North Sea, for example, it's not deep enough for the wind, floating wind farms that we're talking about. You would have to go a long way offshore, places like Japan, the, the sea drops off very, very quickly, and therefore it's, it's more likely to be useful in places like that. Who wants talk about well, that, yeah I'll have a go at that one that's correct you know you, you would obviously if you could you would want some fixed um, foundations for your wind turbines because it's cheaper and, and easier and a great asset for the youth for the UK and, and the, the European countries that border on the North Sea area is that the North Sea in itself is is very shallow uh, over large areas of it so less than 50 meters deep over a big proportion of it and therefore you you don't need floating turbines in that environment and that that's why you know the uk at the moment is the world leader in installed capacity because we have this fantastic asset the north sea that we've been able to because the, the prices have come down so rapidly as as my colleagues have just said we've been able to exploit that so, so that's a good thing not a bad thing um you know the need but but, but not every country has the luxury that we have of a North Sea on your doorstep. And Japan is a great example there. There, the, the uh, depth of the sea increases rapidly as you go offshore, which is why uh, fixed uh, foundation offshore wind turbines aren't applicable to that country and they need floating technology in order to, to exploit the resource. Let's go back to Susan Gurvenek. She's um, offshore geotechnical engineering professor. This is something that she actually put down in paper. While energy companies often build far out at sea, a single floating wind turbine produces a lot less energy than a single offshore oil or gas rig over its operating life, depending on the size of both structures. It could be in the range of 1,000 times less. So you would need 1,000 turbines, this is my question, to get the same as you would off one North Sea oil gas rig? James? Yeah, if, if I could come in on that. I mean, one of the key things is that, yes, a, a single gas turbine may produce more energy, but it's also a lot bigger, you know, maybe 100 or 200 times larger. And it's not just about the, the gas platform as well. You know, once you've got oil out of the ground, it's then got to go through a refinery. Uh, you've got lots more transportation costs. And so it's, it's not really a fair comparison, just the, the one oil or gas platform versus one wind turbine. It's not really a valid comparison. Well, I suppose what she's saying is that we're not yet at the point where you can put the two side by side and say one is producing more energy than the other um, as efficiently cost-wise. Well, I disagree with that completely. I think, I think if you look at the price, um, as you've just heard, now a fixed foundation offshore wind, uh, developers are developing projects at 40, 40 pounds a gigawatt hour here, in, sorry, a megawatt hour here megawatt in, the, hour. Uh, 
in the UK. So that that is comparable with uh, what it costs to generate electricity from a combined cycle gas turbine hmm. power station burning gas, you know, uh, from from oil rigs off. off okay, so 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 a big tick in its favour there, Richard. You, uh, you wanted to say something. At the yeah, point? I mean, I think agreeing uh, with James there, we're not we're not comparing like with like. You know, we you know it's it, it's very different technologies. The you know the the uh, the wind turbines themselves will be producing electricity which can go feed straight into the grid. There's no need to have greater infrastructure to convert uh, gas to electricity. Um, so you know, um, yes, she's correct in what she's saying, but it's we're not comparing the same things. And uh, and ultimately, you know, we have to uh, decarbonize our complete whole energy sector and uh, we can't do that by continuing burning gas beyond the 2030s period so it's uh, vital we have to get this right yeah absolutely and you know we've, we've made huge strides in recent years in the offshore industry uh, we've gone from having very you know the first wind turbines i think might have been in offshore that alive originally but we've now got um, around about nine gigawatts installed we've got consent for another give, give us an idea how many houses that would power uh, that's always the, well, nine gigawatts, um, what's that going to be? I can never get quite as right as either 900,000 or 9 million is one of the two. Well, you have a think about it and we'll yeah. talk to the well, others for the, for the well, time being. Because okay, one of the great well, parts... Yeah. To put, to put nine Simon, sorry, yes, yes. Yeah, to put nine gigawatts into context, that's typically about 25% of the UK's total electricity demand uh, as we speak. Gosh, that's extraordinary. And one of the great advantages, too, um, let's bring James in because you've been quiet for a little while. I was going to ask Richard this one because he's more into the ecological side of it, perhaps. You won't get objections from local residents, will you? Which you would do if it's off Kent or Aberdeen or wherever it happens to be, and it can be a bit unsightly. You could put 10,000 of these out to sea and nobody would know they were there. You can. I mean, they do, they do have an environmental impact, but it's much smaller than uh, onshore and some the alternative technologies. Uh, so, you know, looking after the seabed, looking after fisheries and other uses of the sea is an important part of getting consent for a, a, an offshore wind farm. But it's true, there are very large areas of the seabed that can be used uh, and in this way. Um, and it's, it's a, a more uniform area. You know, finding a, a site on shore for a wind farm is very localised. Offshore, it's a much more uniform uh, working area. OK, for other, one other thing that just occurred to me. Do you have to get some kind of permission? There, there is a treaty on the law of the sea outside your own international water. Simon, you're nodding your head. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. You know, the, the, the Crown Estate releases development rights for offshore wind farms in, in UK waters. And then there's a huge consenting process that, that uh, developers have to go through. But what about further out? Because that's really what we're talking about. Definitely further out. So the first so the the first gigawatt scale we were talking gigawatts a minute ago the first <coughs> excuse me gigawatt scale offshore wind farm was orsted's phase one of the hornsea um uh, ground three site now to, to put this into context if you if you have a look on uh, online at the round three sites hornsea it's not a rectangular shape but it's it's that sort of that sort of uh, sim similar to a rectangle and the long side of the rectangle stretches from hull to liverpool in terms of distance these are the sort of scales of wind farms that we're that we are talking about now uh Ersted are developing it's four gigawatts in total hornsea they're developing it in three phases and they, they have consent to develop the first phase, 1.2 gigawatts is already operating. They're developing phase two now, and they're trying to get consent mm. to develop phase well, three. What if so you're um, 150 miles out to sea, James? Do you know this one? Do they have to abide by the Convention on the Law of the yeah, Sea? I mean, essentially, there are regions of the North Sea that are uh, not UK territorial waters, but, but the UK has control over them. What about uh, other ones, though? The, uh, the the wind farms kind of uh, butt up right against the borders of those regions. So we are using the whole of the North Sea area that, we, that is available to us. I suppose I'm thinking long term in, in the future. Let's say I wanted to put one out in the middle of the Atlantic. What would I do then? Could I just do it? No, you would still need permission and you, you also need to bring the, the energy on shore. So you, there's cables coming ashore and you need consent for those. There's no point generating the power if you can't then use it uh, on shore. So, so yeah, there, there, there's lots of regulations about the whole maritime environment, the law of the sea. If we have not been technical enough already, let's get into how you make these things work when you're out there. Uh, you're not going to have many engineers on site, if, if any. Um, how do you deal with problems? 
Simon, you go on, you go ahead. Okay. Now, you say you're not going to have many engineers out there, but but we're you know the, the oil and gas industry for years has had offshore maintenance crews, etc. So so we're we're probably looking at people, uh, engineers required to maintain and ensure the continued operation of these tur uh, turbines being based offshore for periods of time in order to do that. You know, if your turbine's 100 miles offshore, it takes you eight hours to get there in a boat. And then when you get there, you can only get on it 30% of the time because of the sea state uh, is too, you know, too rough to get on the boat onto the onto the turbine. So you really need to be more responsive than that. You need people based offshore, you need strategic spares offshore, et cetera. And, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the oil and gas industry and technologies to, to tr be transferred in order to enable you to do that. I'm looking at uh, the producer's notes that I was given. And one of the things I was driving at there um, is the fact that each one of you mentions smart operations. In other words, getting machinery on shore or electronics on shore to deal with problems out there and robotics out there. James? So making, making the turbine smarter does mean that you know when problems are starting to occur so that you can make sure that you have the people there when it's needed. But yeah, in the, in the longer term, a lot of things can be done by robots and autonomous systems. Uh, and that potentially saves money, but also uh, avoids putting people into a very risky environment. You know, the North Sea is a pretty hostile environment. And if you can take people away from that, then uh, yeah, that makes a, a much stronger safety case. Who agrees with uh, Malt Janssen, Director of Energy Economics at Imperial College in London, who says energy subsidies used to push up energy bills, but within a few years, cheap renewable energy will see them brought down for the first time. Let's throw that one at you, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it does seem uh, quite remarkable that uh, only yeah, a few years ago yeah, there was um, some obviously rhetoric in, in from certain sectors about the expense and and of renewable energy and it wouldn't generate any electricity. So it's it's really impressive how uh, how the sectors have changed and we're talking maybe in this next round. Um, you know, just just over the weekend, reading that you know it, it might be that uh, uh, the price. Um, for this next round of, of offshore wind energy will be below the, the strike price, which is the generation cost. And so uh, it, it might be that um, you know, the, the, the offshore wind companies may even be uh, reducing the costs of electricity to the consumers, as opposed to it uh, in the past as seen as being something which had put some costs uh, to consumers. So, yeah, it's really positive and, and fantastic um, how the industry has been developing. But the operative word here is cheap when it comes to cheap renewable energy. From what you're saying so far, James, I think you want to say something here. This isn't cheap yet. It, uh, currently, fixed bottom offshore wind is, is one of the cheapest that's available. Um, what I was really wanting to say was that subsidies are important in the journey to get to low cost energy. So without subsidies, bottom fixed offshore wind would still be more expensive. It's now one of the cheapest. Uh, with floating wind, it's the same tra trajectory. We need to have uh, subsidies to get to a point where the, the energy becomes cheaper and becomes uh, competitive and cheaper than the other sort, sort, forms of energy. We're talking about a, a massive engineering feat, aren't we? Because I, I, I read that to power the world by 2050, you would need half a million offshore wind turbines. Perhaps in the great scheme of things, that isn't a lot, but it seems like an awful lot to me. Um, is, is that feasible, Simon? Um, I, I think so, yeah. You, you, you look at, uh, as I've already said, when the wind's blowing, we, the UK has enough installed capacity to, to service about 25% of its electricity needs. So, so we're not surrounded by offshore wind turbines um, to any extent that it's having a significant impact on shipping or other movements. So four times that amount, why not? So I think, uh, yeah, it's feasible. Um, and also, yes, it's about cost, but it's it's also about jobs as well. And there are there are you know the renewable energy industry certainly for the UK and for other countries fantastic opportunities in terms of uh, creating new jobs in low car in the low carbon economy through things like offshore wind, and that's something that if you're all all the time pushing for lowest cost, then then your supply is going to go to 
uh, or be concentrated around the countries that are already the most developed in offshore wind. And for new players, that makes it more, diffi uh, more difficult to break into those markets. So I think there's more to it. If, if we look at this in the round, there's more to it than just, just cost. You've also got to think about jobs. And you've also got to think about any damage it might be doing, because another thing that I picked up on is that the magnets used in these turbines, so Richard, you may want to come in on this, um, are made in some cases with rare, rare earth metals from places like Mongolia. They're toxic. They can be radioactive. There, there are dangers here. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, we, we live in a finite world. Um, we have to make sure that whatever resources we're using, we're trying to be as sustainable as possible. Um, we have, uh, you know, I suppose, ultimately risks in terms of geopolitical um, supply of, of some materials. Um, but also we've got to face the fact that we need energy, we need, uh, you know, we need clean energy. And so we, again, we have to balance up the sort of the, the, uh, the environmental costs and the sort of economic uh, costs um, if we don't go ahead with this. We, you know, if we're going to move to um, zero carbon by 2050 and, and the government's already committed to having 50 gigawatts of wind um, you know, being provided you know, energy um, already. So, so we, we need to you know, have these resources and, and mm. manage them and produce them in a, in a clean so, so and producing way. rare earth metals and the toxicity and the radioactivity and, and the child labour sometimes that comes with this because they come from places where uh, there aren't the best labour practice is, is perhaps a price we will have to pay? No, we Not necessarily. Sure I mean, that, that's that we, why you have organisations such as the ones that we three work in uh, and yeah. we do research and development. You know, we at Durham University, we have active projects at the moment looking at new generator technologies to avoid the use of rare earth metal, metals, for example. So, so you know, this industry is quite young. It's, it's developing um, and growing very, very rapidly. And there are lots and lots of exciting innovations and new things that, that we're looking at at the moment, some of which will come off that will help to address some of these issues. So it's certainly not a given that uh, in order to have offshore wind, you have, you have to have the sort of scenario that you were alluding to a few moments ago. OK, my lad, objection sustained, Richard. <laughs> uh, I was not trying to put words into your mouth. I, it was just a natural thought process for me that th well, it might be the trade-off that was needed. Um, is it the future, do you think, James? I think it's a, it's a big part of the future. Um, it's, it, it'll never be the whole answer, and it won't be the answer for some regions. In some regions, you know, maybe solar is a, is a more attractive solution. But certainly for large parts of the, the globe, it is a, a big part of the future. Um, there are challenges, you know, as you've realised, the wind doesn't blow all of the time, and so it needs to be paired with things like energy storage. Um, but out at sea, the wind is more constant. The larger you make a wind farm, the more uh, any variation in the wind uh, averages out. So, yeah, it's not the full solution, but it's a big part of the solution. And will we be able to see them from space at some point like we can, supposedly? The, the Great Wall of China, are they going to be that um, ubiquitous? You can currently see individual turbines from satellite images. Um, you know, they are actually quite small. You know, a typical turbine is maybe 100 metres across, but they're uh, 100 metres apart, so they are kind of dots within a, an area. You can see them, but they're, they're not you know, obtrusive objects when you look at us from space. OK, a bit of a giggle from you on that one, Simon. Yeah, it was much easier to see a dirty coal-fired power station from space than it is an offshore wind yes. turbine. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> well, actually, you'd be much clearer the skies at the moment to be able to see them. Richard, Absolutely. It is an answer, isn't it? It's not one answer. Yeah, I think the, I mean, you know, there's going to be a mix of different technologies. We, his, we've always had a mix of energy resources uh, in our past. We've had, you know, coal, which we don't, you know, aren't using anymore, coal, gas, uh, hydropower, nuclear. And so as we're transitioning to, to net zero, to a cleaner future, we're going to have new technologies uh, coming along. Um, power supply is only Part of uh, part of a problem. We've got to also think about other areas as well, transport, buildings, uh, all of which we need to decarbonise. And and one advantage with having a lot of offshore wind and and or even onshore wind is that when we've got excess, we can convert that to hydrogen, or we can trade it to other countries. Uh, we can you know, with interconnectors, uh, so we can balance our our network and our supply. And then we can use hydrogen then for our alternative to our ground transport, so for tractors, for lorries and, uh, you know, make a much cleaner uh, world uh, for us to, to live in into the future. Simon, fi final word, if, if I may. Um, are our government, our authorities worldwide taking this seriously enough to make it viable and something that we can look on as we head towards net zero? 
I think government, uh, most governments, not all, I think most governments are. I think the UK government certainly is. You know, look at that fantastic, I, I think uh, offshore wind turbines, onshore wind turbines are beautiful things. And I look at that picture behind you and that's only been possible because the UK government has stuck with subsidies through the, the high cost times. And now we enjoy the, the, low, the low cost uh, times that we're now in. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder or perhaps Absolutely. in the ear of the beholder if you happen to live close to them which I don't, but I see them when I go to Cornwall, and they can make a heck of a racket, which of course doesn't matter if they're 100 miles out to sea. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, James. Thank you, Richard. Great to have you on the programme. And thank you, wherever you happen to be watching this programme, for joining us on Roundtable. We hope to have your company again. For now, though, goodbye.